meeting to order. All right, hello everybody. We're gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order and we do have a quorum. And so I'm gonna read this disclosure. All right, this meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with ordinance number 20A14, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. The committee members who are electronically present at this meeting are Lonnie Murray, Peggy Cornett, uh, Dan Mahone, Abigail Wilson, Michael uh, Callahan. And did I get everybody? Uh, Kate Malik is uh, attending by phone. And is Kate, Kate was going to attend by phone. She is, she's present. Oh, and Kate Malik. Okay, fantastic. And, right. All right, and to recognize we have, and I'm just gonna go ahead and finish this up. So the opportunities for the public to access the electronic media are posted in, on the Almoral County website, on the Board of Supervisors homepage, and on the Almoral County calendar. All right, great. And I'd like to uh, recognize Neil Williamson and uh, and Tendi, so thank you for joining us. And uh, we're going to go ahead and begin. And uh, before we get started here, I would really like to, um, Dan Mahone is joining us as a new member. And just because uh, we've had, <laughs> this is the first time he's been able to actually join the meeting in this capacity. He has spoken to the Natural Heritage Committee on many occasions and has been a guest and uh, feel really fortunate to have us uh, join our committee. And so maybe we could just, uh, I don't know if Dan, you want to give us a little bit of background and then we can just do a round of introductions so that you can uh, kind of formally meet everybody. Oh, Dan, I think you're muted. So if you could, you might have to unmute yourself. I would, I wasn't gonna say anything really worth it. Um, <laughs> no, I was gonna say that, uh, uh, for 25 years, I guess, I was, I've worked with the county in a number of capacities from working as a subdivision planner, working with Margaret with uh, historical resources. Um, I escaped from community development and went to parks and spent a significant amount of time actually taking the comp plan as it was presented. And it was the first comp plan that actually had Greenway corridors on it. Um, I saw the the Greenway corridors as the uh, green infrastructure um, uh, as as well as a recreational transportation thing. But but um, so my approach to the Greenway um, program initially was um, water resource protection. Um, sort of um, looking for those ways of connecting and and acquiring park land that can be everything that goes into green infrastructure planning was the approach that uh, that I was taking um, and also looking at um, staff and how to transform staff from um, ball field maintenance folks to stewards of public lands. And um, then one day I just said, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. And I retired. <laughs> but anyway, I've, I've, um, I've got a lot of experience on the ground with uh, some of the questions. And I've been reviewing this um, document here. And it's, there's good things there um, and things to discuss. Great. Oh, thank you so much. It's really great to have you part of the committee. And I think you, you definitely have a lot to add. So um, Dan, you know me. So maybe we could just go sort of around uh, the room here, so to speak. Um, Peggy, do you mind going next? I, I think you guys, you know each other probably. Yeah, we've met uh, several times in different mm -hmm. places. <laughs> we, we took that hike uh, uh, not too long ago. Um, but anyway, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm curator. I'm still working. <laughs> I'm curator of plants at Monticello. I've been there for uh, mm -hmm. almost 40 years and uh, 
I have a big interest in uh, native plant ecology, you know, habitat preservation, um, uh, and and um, you know, preservation in general. So that's my background. Yeah, we've had good discussions. Yes. Thanks, Peggy. And Lonnie, I think you and Dan probably do you, do you need an introduction. <laughs> probably not. I, <laughs> I, I think we've met. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lonnie. Hey, how's it going, Dan? Fantastic. All right. Um, and then Abigail, you could, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, Dan. Uh, my name's Abigail. I live out in Crozet, but I did live in Charlottesville for about five years. And uh, I have a lot of experience, and I was just hoping to volunteer on a planting day. And they asked if I would come join the committee. So I'm pretty new as well. I'm still kind of figuring out where to jump in. Um, but I didn't even know this work was happening before the invitation. So it's been really exciting just to meet people who are so inspired and working really hard to, to make some of the things possible. Good. Well, we're, we're neighbors out here in Crozet. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Abigail. And then Michael. Hi, hey, Dan. Welcome. Hey. Um, I'm Mike Callahan. I'm a uh, urban and environmental planner by education, program manager. Uh, I served in the Air Force for 20 years, and then we moved to North Carolina, where I was uh, a municipal official and local city council, town council for four years until we came up here. So, uh, you know, like everybody else, COVID has kind of put us on hold for a couple of years, uh, but I did manage to get through the uh, Master Gardener program through uh Cooperative Extension. Uh, so I'm the Speakers Bureau Coordinator for the Master Gardeners right now and uh, try to contribute in in as many ways as I can. I have a wife recovering from hip surgery, so uh, I've been kind of on the shelf for a little while, but she's, she's progressing and looking forward to getting back to uh, getting things done. <laughs> so welcome. Where in my... Yeah, that palm tree is one... Yeah, the palm tree is great. Where in my... Where in say, Carolina were you from? Uh, live, I mean... Uh, Brunswick, the town of Leland in Brunswick County. Okay. Okay. Across the river from uh, Wilmington. I'm from uh, North. I'm from Southern Pines, and okay. uh, lived in Chapel Hill and Winston Salem. So, I know yeah. North Carolina well. <laughs> yeah, and then my my grandparents. I have a lot of family from Duplin. So. Okay. Been through Duplin every time I go north and south. <laughs> yeah. Actually, Venus flytraps that first got me into conservation. So. Which... Out in the big green swamp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've made many trips to the Green Swamp to photograph those yeah. guys. It's a great place. Sounds like a cool place to go. And and then Kate, can you are you here that you can introduce yourself? Is Kate is she a panelist? She can't be promoted to a panel um, from phone. Okay, but um, Vivian can can I, I, make it possible for her to speak. You you know Kate then. I, I, I know Kate. I've worked with Kate, yeah. Okay. All right. No introduction needed then, it sounds like. Well, yeah. at any rate, Dan, welcome. I'm I'm glad we were able to the weather cooperated and we could make it happen and that you are having your first official meeting. So Christine, um, I'm here now. This is Kate. It took me out. I had trouble unmuting myself. Um, I just wanted to say hi to Dan, and we've met in lots of fun places over the years, and welcome. Yeah, thanks. Great. Thank you, Kate. And um, I, I see Margaret here, and I just wanted to say hi. And Dan, we miss you. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Um, so if we could go ahead, um, I hope everybody had an opportunity to look at the agenda and uh i i actually start, yeah, go ahead, Lonnie. i was having trouble finding the agenda before this meeting so maybe if if you could share the agenda would that be possible to put it up on screen yeah i'm, I'm trying to do that right now oh, oh there we go thank you so oh, much. wonderful thank you um i actually if we have time i would love to just talk about uh the woodridge solar project and just give you guys an update of what's happening with that so um, to add that in there at some point. But if uh, can, can somebody like to move to approve the agenda. 
I'll move to approve the agenda Thanks, with uh, the addition. All right, great. I'll second. Thanks, Peggy. And uh, Kate, do you approve? Let's see. All right, I'm going to move yeah. on. Okay, great. Dan? Yes. yes. Abigail? Yes. Great, thank you. And Mike? Yes. And Peggy, okay. Thank you. And Bruce is not here. Uh, Leah said that she would not be here. And Emma is in Scotland, uh, taking a month long holiday, which is pretty cool. Um, and then hopefully everybody got a chance to see Kim's fantastic minutes from June. You didn't call me, but. Oh, Lonnie, uh, sorry, Lonnie. <laughs> Lonnie, do you approve? I, I do. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. Although I'm looking looking here, do we have a, oh yeah, we do have important site. Okay, are you good? I'm good. Okay, fantastic. Um, so if we could go ahead and have a motion to approve the June minutes. I move that we approve the June minutes. Thank you, Mike. Second. Thank you, Lonnie. And do we really have to go back and ask you again for have you vote on it? Yeah, it's you have to. Okay. Do both. All right, Lonnie, is that a yes vote on that? Yes, I. Okay, Peggy. Yeah, I. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Kate. Yes. Okay, Dan, you were not there, so we're not going to call yes. on you. And then Abigail. I approve. Great. And Mike, you were not there either. So I think we. Um, were yeah, I was at the June meeting. Oh, you were? Okay, sorry. Mike, uh, do you approve? I approve. Okay, fantastic. All right. Uh, we have all that taken care of. So we're going to uh, go to the follow ups and important sites, updates, and outreach. Does anybody have anything that they would like to share? I do. Um... So as you know, I've been trying to track down historic occurrences of plants. Um, so my wife and I went to go track down an occurrence of um, Prunus nigra or Canadian plum in Amaral County that was reported by Mo Stevens. And I'm, I'm sad to say that after extensive searching for this, that we could not find that, um, we could not find that species. And um, it's unfortunate, I realized after I went there that this is, this is actually a road that was recently paved. Um, it was on the county's paving list. Um, and so as part of that paving project, they also cleared a bit of this, the, the side too. So I can't say for certain whether this had any impact on this species, but certainly isn't great. Um, it would have been nice to have had that data beforehand before this got on the paving list. And, been able to say something to the county that this rare species occurred there, because um, this is an S1 species in Almar County. I'm oh, sorry, S1 species in the state, sorry, which is critically, it's critically endangered. So not great news, but any data is good data, I guess. Yeah. Is, is there any way in the future that there could be somebody could be alerted to the fact that that those plants are there, or at least they could be saved or relocated. Well, you know, re relocation is always a tricky business because yeah. you know it, you can't relocate a habitat, and, and really, it's it's the habitat that's the the big issue here. I mean, but I think in terms of. Um, I brought up for many times that I think the amount of information provided to the Board of Supervisors when these paving projects come before them is insu insufficient. And I think, you know, having, if we, if we did have knowledge about, for example, a gravel road going by a special site or by a special species occurrence, that's the sort of information I, I do think that we should try to provide and make, make available to supervisors before that decision is made to put it on that paving list or to, to um, complete the paving on that road. Um, 
On, an, on another update, and this one's a little bit more positive, um, we also saw an occurrence of a very strange species for Armour County, um, Monarda didyma, which is typically we see um, Monarda fistulosa in the county. So the, the red one is very unusual for Armour County. It's not reported for Armour County in the flora, but we did, um, we did track down an INAT observation of this species. And, um, and we, we did find um, that this, we did find it. So it's, <laughs> what's, what's trickier to figure out is whether someone introduced this somehow, or is this an old home site or- um, Yeah, it might've been planted somehow. Yeah, it, it is way up in the mountains. So I don't have any, you know, it's not a rare species. I'll just tell you, it's on Jarman's Gap Road. So the Germans, you know, nice. almost almost before you get up to the um, to the parkway. So so it is an interesting um, it's an interesting occurrence. Well, do you think it's possible that that prunus might, if it was cut down, it could suck her up or something, or was it just totally uh, scraped and stripped? Well, you know, I I, I don't know, and I also. I also um, gave a word to, you know, and we don't, we didn't have, we had limited time, you know, our botanical forays often have kids, we have kids in the car and they're like, mom, dad, are you done looking at plants? Mm -hmm. So um, I think a more exhaustive search could be done than what we did. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And we also limited ourselves very strictly to the to the roadsides um, because there is private property there. Right, okay. Um, so maybe with landowner permission, someone could do a more exhaustive search than we did. Um, I did mention it to Devin in case um, he and his folks were at all interested in, in doing that. Okay. Well, yeah, it's unfortunate, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it could also be this, you know, there's a reason it's called Canadian plum too. So this is also could be a con, you know, weather this could also be a casualty of climate change as well. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah, that's very, very likely too as well. Gone the way of the uh, Franklinia. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I thanks for that update. Sad as it is. Uh, Lonnie, is there anyone else who has has been has visited an important site or has anything to update? I had a question about the important sites. Yeah, um, I was looking through some of the folders and realized that a lot of them haven't had a visit in the last two to three years. And so I was just curious if we have a certain cadence that we're aiming for, or if some have priority over the others, um, and uh, and I guess like what kind of documentation is really important, like what the aim of this is, because um, I'd be happy to to start doing some more visits and gaining some more knowledge about those sites currently. Um, but it'd be helpful to have a bit more context. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'd be happy to meet with you, Abigail, and same with you, Dan, to we we set up a whole protocol for that and it has really gone by the wayside. And at one point we, we sort of made a call out for people to pick one or two or three important sites and sort of be the steward of those important sites and keep an eye on them. So like, for example, I do the, the Blenheim grass lands because it's really close to me. Um, and I did sign up for some other ones and I have not really followed through very well with that, but there is a protocol for contacting the landowner. I just happen to own the Blenheim grassland, so that makes it super easy for me. Uh, but some of them are also in our public lands as well. So, and then we, we did prioritize them into these conservation focus areas, but I would, I'd be happy to you know, we could meet and kind of go through those files and look at um, the report forms that we have. So there is a whole system. And, uh, but I would say that's 
kind of a fun thing. One of the fun parts of being part of the Natural Heritage Committee that's sort of gone by the wayside a little bit, and maybe part of that's COVID, but you know, it's so, so hot this summer, but maybe this fall, it'd really be great if we could get together as a group and have an important site visit together. Um, I think, and you can see we've got some real expertise on the committee and it's really fun to go out with you experts. Christine, so. I think that's a, that's an excellent idea. That's something that I've been, uh, I think, missing. Um, and I would almost uh, uh, suggest that maybe we do some kind of uh, a training session for all of us on that protocol um, to try and uh, engender that back into our, our committee so that we're all familiar with how to do that and then right. have a priority and then make commitments to go do that. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great idea. And um, you know, maybe that's something that we should we meet in person to do it, and uh, we can we can make it a public meeting, and uh, that way we don't have to tie up somebody to oversee a virtual meeting. And it might just be easier to do it that way. But let's aim to do that this fall. Yeah, I think that's a great idea to make a public meeting and just go through the whole rigmarole and um, so that we all get together and do something like that. I think that would be really great. Yeah, yeah we could visit a, uh, the site, kind of see, we'll have the forms out, get a sense of how to do the report and, uh, you know, go with it. our botanist, which really makes a difference. I will say there's at least one site in that list that's at its best in summer. Um, the Red Hill Wetlands it is, is a good one. And we've actually had, we've, we've gone there before. We even had a county supervisor come with us at one time. Um, and um, I believe we made that a public meeting. But, and that's a very cooperative landowner. So if, if we wanted to go see an example of one of the special sites with someone who's generally very welcoming already to this committee, um, we could we could do that. And, and we, would that be like appropriate to do in like September? Um, I mean, we well, I would probably choose a different site if we were to do a September. I would, well, of course, we've never really been to that site in September. So, I mean, I guess it'd be fine. Yeah. Um, there might, maybe we'll see different stuff than we normally see. Yeah. Yep. Well, Lonnie, I'll be in touch with you about that. And uh, perhaps that's the way to go. Also, we have a couple places that, yeah, maybe we could start there. But I really think it would be great to um, get together and do something like that. All right, we'll put it on our to-do list. And thank you, Abigail, for bringing it up because I feel like it is really kind of gone by the wayside. The next item is the spotted lantern uh, fly now. I hope that probably everybody knows at this point that Albemarle County is now under quarantine, and um, I don't have a lot of specifics on that or what that means. But that was effective July first. And since I don't have a ton of information on that, I'm going to move on and let Margaret give the staff update. Sure. Actually, um, Christine um, Kim gave me just uh, one little tidbit of information on the spotted lantern fly and that was to say that the um, outreach campaign which includes email social media and, and website updates and is uh, coordinated with DCE it will be launching in um, mid-July okay thank you the other this uh, is Kate I just have a quick question before we move on from that is someone, is there someone who would help gather more information about this quarantine and what that means? I think that might be important for us to know so that we can help um, other residents to, to know more. Well, I, Kate, I, I'll just tell you from having worked with Carrie Swanson at the VCE, who's really kind of the resident uh, person that's tracking that as well as giving updates when she has the opportunity to do that. Uh, the best information is on VCE's website. Uh, the latest uh, update and uh, quarantines require uh, 
companies that are moving things uh, to have somebody trained uh, and certified and then they train people within their own organization. Uh, that's really what the quarantine means. Uh, before people can move uh, lumber, for instance, or other kinds of products uh, that lantern flies are typically uh, attracted to. There's other information related to the uh, tree of heaven and other uh, food sources that the lantern fly likes uh, on that as well. So, uh, okay, I will absolutely. I appreciate that. Um, my concerns are often related to implementation. You know, I I found in a lot of these situations the the lovely, hey, we're under quarantine, yay, we're doing something, but in practice, that the the lack of procedure. Um, so I'm really interested in the granularity of that. So I'll reach out to them. Yeah, website should tell you that. Okay, great. Thanks, Mike. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another point of update from staff is the August 3rd um, update on the Stream Health Initiative. It's scheduled on the Board of Supervisors agenda. So you want to um, uh, take note of that date. That's August 3rd. Um, if you're interested, you can um, attend that uh, meeting to learn more, or you can review the meeting materials once they're posted, and that will usually be um, a week before the meeting date. Any, any preview? Sometimes Kim will give us a preview of, of what topics will be discussed. Um, do you... I don't have that detail. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. We can look at the agenda as well right so yeah yeah we can yeah and the great thing is i just want to encourage people to use the e-comment and to uh you know speak up as you know as you read that and it's a great opportunity to kind of voice your thoughts on it all right, thanks, Margaret. <laughs> you keep going. <laughs> Sorry. And then uh, just one more point uh, on the environmental stewardship hub. Uh, Kim wanted you all to know that we're adding a page for financial resource opportunities, and that will be organized by the same categories. Um, I think that you're all familiar with uh, at home, on your land, and in your community. And um, they welcome ideas that you all may have to add to that page. Um, and you should say it could also uh, include things like organizations and programs that provide um, free technical assistance and that sort of thing. So um, take a look and send your send your ideas on in. Um, and that is everything that Kim had for today's staff update. Thank you, Margaret. Welcome. Margaret, is, could you share the the BAP goals and recommendations? Did is that easy for you to do? Yeah, I think I've got that up. Let me stop sharing this document. And um, that is a several page document. So I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, we're just, we're going to, what you guys, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and um, do that review. And we've already looked at goal number one. Um, and then uh, there's gold if you could scroll down to goal number two and i i just want to add that i don't know if anybody else listened to the presentation to the board about the ace program did anybody else tune into that well i found it was interesting really in just uh the questions that the board of supervisors asked and i can you know give just a little bit of the ACE program is going to go through that review and update, but it won't be completed until 2024. And in the meeting, they did look at uh, from the 2021 applications, there's the Campbell easement uh, and then the Henley easement. And so I think that they are going to, there's going to be an, they're going to the appraisal review committee and um, looking at that it's gonna come back to the board for that. But there is, I guess there is some money in the fund. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it was, it would have been enough to co cover the Henley easement, which is in the water protection, water supply protection area. Um, but, is everybody familiar with the ACE program? It's the Almond County 
uh, easement program really focused on preserving farmland and especially for uh, people sort of working farms and uh, what about your lower income kind of farmers? And so there, there were some interesting questions yeah. that were asked. Uh, you know, we got somebody who's not, we got a little bit of background there. I'm not sure who it is. Is that Bruce? Um, Bruce just check yourself so I can pass to you. All right, Bruce. Until you get there. Yes. Oh, Bruce, yes. Hi. welcome. Glad you could join us. Thank you. I dropped something. I'll be back in a minute. Okay, great. But I, th I thought that the discussion from the board was interesting. Ned Galloway uh, asked a lot of questions about how do you measure the economic aspect of this. Um, uh, he wanted to know how many of the properties that are now in the ACE easement are actually working farms. And he was, you know, asking if there is some data about those lands that are in, that have become uh, part of the ACE program, what's happening with that property right now? And so those were some of his questions. And Jim Andrews, um, he was kind of curious about, well, he made the statement, which I thought was great. He's, he, he really reiterated the importance of including um, how important it is to protect biodiversity, forest cover, and to think about climate action and stream health and to take those things in consideration uh, when the ACE program is updated. Lonnie, do you have a question? Yeah, and um, just, just adding to that, I know there was some question that was raised about the impact of the um, of easements on the on revenue sharing and also the, the school funding formula. And so that, that's kind of been, there's, there's been a lot of debate about that, but it, I believe that's been settled. Yeah. I, I, was, I was actually surprised it was brought up because I thought it was a settled issue years ago, but, but essentially the, it also, these conservation easements also save us money as a county um, because they reduce the amount of money we have to pay in revenue sharing to the city. And they also um, make the, because they, the school funding formula also is based upon like how much revenue the county gathers and because it reduces the the tax value of the of the properties and with the assessed assessment value of properties in Admiral County, it does make it more favorable to the um, school funding formula as well. I know there's a more technical name for the school funding formula. I brain foggy right now, don't remember the name of yeah. that. That was definitely brought up, and I think that that was definitely clarified during the meeting as well. And, and oh, your so they, points, your points were reiterated. Okay. So that was good. So, um, but yeah. going going to the recommendations, I think these recommendations are still completely appropriate. I would add a fourth one. Um, I think that we should we should recommend. You know, we've talked before about the. Um, single comp plan designation for the entire rural area and how maybe, you know, things like greenways should be expressly, you know, in growth areas, we have identified greenways in our, our growth area. Um, and that we should do the same thing in the rural area as well, that we should identify areas that we would like to see as green space or greenways. Um, and actually have them with a with a comp plan designation and or even zoning. That's a great idea. I think that's an excellent recommendation myself. Any other thoughts on that? I fully support it. Yeah, As, especially how it relates to climate action and connectivity. And uh, I mean, the communities that I have visited with greenways in them are so vibrant. It's a real draw for tourism. People love the opportunity to get on a bike. Bonnie. We're getting some strange static there. Is that you, Lonnie? Nope, not me. Oh, 
Okay. Very staticky. Hmm. Is it, is, it I, is it Margaret? I believe it's actually a Zoom error. I've been encountering it in all oh, of the okay. meetings today. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. <Interesting. laughs> yeah, that was what I was talking about earlier. It sounded like a vacuum cleaner was going or something. Huh. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we may we, we might want to change one word, add another word here. See, um, revise ACE and PRFA easement acceptance criteria to reflect biodiversity values and conservation needs. We might want to also include some language about climate change in there, in there as well. Yeah, I think that's. And uh, what do you think about this idea of just forest cover? Um, well, as if we're going to do that, we, some change. well, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a complex thing. I, I think um, <laughs> we could go down to a rabbit hole there uh, because I mean, we could say natural cover, maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because, you know, you know, there's a lot of data that suggests that native grasslands have as much carbon sequestration um, or more than than forests do. So, so I would say you know promoting natural, pr promoting native cover maybe, um, maybe as, as long as we're clear that we're not talking about lawns. Well, yeah. Well, lawn grass is not native, so it, it would yeah. not qualify. So maybe not uh, natural cover necessarily, but native. Yeah. Um, maybe since stream health was brought up by the board, maybe that too should be referenced. Mm -hmm. Those are good suggestions. Yeah, because it, and, uh, in the protection of water supply, so definitely stream protection. Yeah, that, that sounds great. Anybody else have something to add for this goal too? Christine, thank you. Give, give you all just a, a quick update. Um, when you were, um, you mentioned the, um, the ACE appraisal review committee, uh, that group did meet today. They did not complete their work. Um, they want to meet again in September when they can meet in person and, and do the work together. All right, thank you for that update. Mm -hmm. All right. Fantastic. I know that uh, I'm not sure if you, is everybody's paying attention to the justice property uh, in Southern Albemarle that is actually, I don't know how much of it, but a good portion of it is going up for auction. And uh, mm -hmm. for the first year in about two years, there's actually um, some type of green cover on that land because it had laid been laid bare for two years with no cover on it at all. So I was happy to see that something has been planted and, uh, but it is up for auction right now. And there's an article in Daily Progress, which I'll send to you um, if you are interested. But that is, that is some, the land that is in conservation right now. And, and or under a conservation easement. All right. Oh, and I thought the other thing that was interesting as well is uh, that Almoral County does have a lot of land that is under easement, but we do we really like the need for staff to, um, to be able to answer some of these questions that, you know, how many of the properties are working farms, what's happening with them? to sort of follow up um, with these properties, you know, if we don't, is there some, it's important to have some staff um, to be able to oversee them, to make sure that what we intend to be happening on that property is in fact happening on it. Well, All right. <laughs> That's an issue, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that, yeah. <laughs> the other side of that coin. Yeah. Um, so if are we ready to move on to goal three then? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. So this is conduct outreach and educate 
the public and landowners on the importance of preserving habitat areas and managing land wisely, provide more opportunities and incentives for landowners to conserve biodiversity and other resources. And so the first recommendation is investigate changes to the land use value valuation uh, program to encourage conservation, consider reducing the minimum acreage requirement for open space use to five acres. And Kim sent me a note and she said that that, is, that will not happen unless uh, there are changes made in the general at the state level. So, but she said that there are things that still can be done, she believes, in our land use valuation program um, that can, we can work to promote um, conservation. And so I, I would certainly like to hear more from Kim on, about that uh, because I personally wrote a letter to the Board of Supervisors just with my continuing concern about property in Southern Albemarle that is still um, in that getting the ag land use designation and but not producing any agricultural product. So, you know, how can that, how can we make sure that that is, we at the very least encourage uh, management of those properties that, that they can have some conservation value rather than supporting big lawns. Oh, so they're getting just, and they're still mowing. In other words, it's not just an open space, a meadow or something, but it's just uh, 20 acres of mowed lawn. Yeah. Exactly. And that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. yeah. So it's really, I think it's a missed opportunity um, because those are just beautiful properties that could be supporting, uh, you know, ground nesting birds or grassland birds just with little tweaks in their mowing schedule, they could be really providing some ecological benefit. And, you know, how do we get that word out there and make it possible? Uh, it's possible that we could try to carry some education to the public with regard to the environmental services that are provided in a in a biodiversity type of habitat. I don't know that the general public is understands uh, what environmental services mean. And if you're not using uh, property the way it was intended to be, if you're qualifying for an agricultural benefit, um, and thus uh, negating any opportunity for an environmental service to take place, there's an economic loss there, I think, at least it seems to me there would be an economic loss there. You implied that uh, Supervisor Galloway was interested in economic information or details. That's some of the kind of information that could be provided if there is a way to articulate the values of environmental services. Absolutely. No, I, I agree. And I think that um, as we learn more about the, you know, the importance of those environment, ecological services, that um, that's part of our job is help to convey the information to both the board and to the general public. You know, I, I'd I like to- using the wrong word, I'm sorry. Ecological, not environmental, ecological. I'd like to- add something to this this thought i think this is where it would go um i really think that that um county park staff or or um or whatever whatever staff is involved in care maintaining uh county properties that there's an opportunity to have like um um Training, uh, continuing education credits, something to to incentivize um, just even the the ground level workers into an awareness of what they're doing. I've I've seen some I've intervened in some real disasters of folks that you know they get into the zen of the mo the lawnmower, and next thing you know, um, it's it's 
we had a hard time at one point setting aside areas to be left alone. Um, and a lot of the folks, I don't know, I just, I see an opportunity to have an in-service training and um, continuing education credit, something that, that folks could, um, you know, an incentive. Anyway. Yeah. I really like that idea. I think it has been spoken about in the past. I think, you know, yeah. the explicit goal, I think would be a great thing to do. And I sorry, think. folks, I was kicked out for a moment because my, one of my family members pushed the trash can against the, the wireless router and unplugged it. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we almost, right. I almost feel like we need to go door to door to some of these places. Just, I mean, you know, or, or I don't know. I mean, how do you get it, get the information on a broader level? Like, you know, a, mm. uh, something on television. I mean, I, like I'm watching television news and they were, uh, you know, I can't even explain this story, but it just almost went crazy when I saw it, you know, and then all these neighbors were coming to mow this guy's property to help to help them out, you know, because they did they just had to push more. And so here comes a neighbor with the riding mower and they're mowing this beautiful meadow that the, and, and it was on the news and they were like heralding it. And then people bought them a riding mower and it was just, I just went crazy watching it. You know, it's I mean it's just yeah people just don't know, you know, it's just very frustrating. Yeah, Abigail, do you yeah, so um, I'm not very familiar with the open space, but it seems like the language here is really talking about specific landowners, like a person who owns a house. And so I'm curious, especially given the patterns of development here, if we are also approaching developers so that they can use some of these considerations as they're developing land. And then as you say, Peggy, like maybe as part of their welcome package, which I assume is given when people buy a house, like maybe we could include flyers on um, suggested plant communities for that area or our flyer on conservation lawns, that sort of thing. Um, so to partner with the developers, not only so that they can maybe change their methods a bit, but also so they can evangelize for us <laughs> how effective that would be. You know what? I think that is just a really excellent idea. I love it because uh, those, you know, if you could, we could make some inroads with the developers and give them some information and just have a sit down and have a conversation with them. Uh, because I bet they, they would, you know, I bet there are some out there that would definitely be open to it. And yeah. And I think there would be people who would like to do that on like the, the ethical, moral stance, mm -hmm. but also, I mean, economically. Um, I know there are organizations around here that will provide funding for ecological restoration if it shows improvements in things like water runoff and storm drainage. And so especially if we were fluent, I'm personally not, but if we are fluent in uh, what kind of organizations were supporting that, we could help them partnership um, and maybe lift up all of those efforts. Because mm -hmm. I know that the economic angle is often more effective with those groups. Well, I think... I think there are also some, some opportunities there. I think one of the things that's happened since this was written is that we have now have the Admiral Conservation Assistance Program. We should explicitly mention that about support, continue to support that program. But I also think there's some adjustments that could be made to that program. The way it's set up now, um, none of those funds can, it was modeled after the state program and none of the funds can be used for, um, it can't be used for an existing development. But one of the changes that, that I've recommended for a long time was that, um, that if someone has met their, their minimum stormwater requirements, that they should be able to, to use, um, as long as they've already met their minimum requirements with the county, they should be able to also use like the um, ACAP to as enhancement. So like, for example, they installed a building that has, um, they ins installed an apartment building. Then when they want to go back and plant a green roof on, on top of it, they should be able to, uh, they should be able to qualify for those funds. Um, or um, they wanted to, they were putting, you know, detention basins and they want to, you know, they want to enhance those and bring them up to do biofilters and not just like, you know, muddy pits. Like, I think that those are things that 
we should allow them to qualify for a little bit broader than, than this. But I think, um, I think that that might be some ways to reach out to the development community. I will also say, um, particularly since um, Neil Williamson is, is with us, um, I, I've been invited to speak of the Charlottesville Association of Realtors. I think I've got their name right. Um, mm -hmm. And, and that's, you know, there are groups like that, that I think that this, this group can, can also reach out to, and they often are looking for people to present. Um, and so maybe we could have um, some staff put together some presentation for that. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I, I excellent. Um, and yeah, Abigail, I'd love to talk more with you about that because I think that that is a, a nice a route to pursue and also reaching out to CAR as well. Um, so we, number two, contact the landowners of important sites throughout Almoron County to educate and inform them of the biodiversity resources on and near their property and develop relationships and encourage conservation of the land. And I think I touched upon this and you can see there's these uh, letters that are associated with each of these and the N uh, is really, this is what they're thinking is this is going to be the natural heritage committee. So our job to actually uh, do that work. I can't remember what the other ones stand for. <laughs> I should know that what C and P stand for. Margaret, what did they say? What does it say on that document? I know it's in there. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so S is staff, P is partner organizations and C county staff. Uh, county staff. So thank you for that. Um, but definitely recommendation number two is on us. And uh, we have made some pushes to do that. I can resend that document. So maybe after our visit together, to an important site in September. One thing I just think that it did take time and energy uh, to reach out uh, to those landowners. And we had, I have a sample letter um, and we just, you know, following through with that did not happen. So. Christine, do we have a, uh, in the county, do we have a land stewardship program certification program that we could uh, point people in the direction of or is that something that is possibly needed and we could work on trying to develop something like that i mean we have well, tree stewards why not land stewards yeah i think it was when i was in maine uh i talked to the their natural resources manager there i just happened to meet in South Portland, and they are going to have, they have, they're going to develop something where, and it was really about no mow May, and um, they, we're, they're they gonna do it for next year. They're gonna give the participating uh, landowners a sign to put in their yard to help educate everybody to say, they'll have some criteria that they need to follow, but there are like the National Wildlife Federation have some, programs and of course the master gardeners are working on the healthy landscape program. But I think it would be interesting to research that and to see if there are other localities that have developed a program like this. And I think that would be maybe the first step in that. Like, are there I'd, other I'd models? Look, I'd be willing to look into that. Um, okay, that would be great. I mean, it's, it's also worth noting that you can conservate, sorry, I can't speak to you can contact the conservation district and have a conservation plan written for your property. So there are there are agencies that will work with landowners to to develop conservation plans. I think there may be some of that a little bit more of that lacking in the homeowner homeowner level. There's a little bit more on the ag side, but um, but I would I would kind of like us to see. I'd like to, to see promoting those existing programs a lot more. Yeah. Yeah, so th there's lots of ways to do it, but I think, Michael, it would definitely be wonderful to take a look and see if there are other, you know, model programs that... I will. 
I'll, 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 uh, I'll start beating the uh, beating bushes for that. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I, um, <clears throat> I think it's this goal that that I might want to speak to, but I think yeah. I think um, land use valuation. Um, I, I I don't think we should forget um, the the cultural heritage. There's the natural heritage, the cultural heritage, but there's there's there are things that bring people bring the public to the table that bring their interest. There's so many layers that of value that you can put on a piece of land that in, inspires different groups for different reasons. Um, <clears throat> I think investigating that and finding a way to at least link, um, if, if you're speaking to conserving a particular area, you might also show that, that the landform there was once um, terraces for orchards in the 20s. It's, it's things like that that bring a story to people. Um, I don't know, I, I don't know where it would fit, but it just seems to me that that's something that <clears throat> with uh, land use value is important to bring to it. The whole uh, Monacan settlement along the, the uh, Ravana River, um, Mm -hmm. is, is an example of a story that means a lot to people. And um, I'll probably speak to this more as I go along, but I just, I'm trying to figure out where it might fit. And <clears throat> I think that's a great point is the, to include or incorporate the history of land. I've, I've been doing uh, some reading about uh, how land was uh, developed back in colonial times and uh, especially in Albemarle County, how, you know, Albemarle County keeps coming up uh, with reference to Jefferson and, and others. Um, you know, this, this land has been here for a long time and owned by a lot of different people. And as we're, we're talking about it, uh, who owned it uh, or who lived on it? and what kind of things were done in the area and why has it evolved the way it evolved, has evolved. Uh, so I think yeah. there's a lot to look into. I think, uh, and Lonnie, you might know something about this with your soil uh, background, but but uh, the freshets, you know, when you read old um, county history, there's a pre-freshets area era and a post-freshets, freshets. And, and um, it had to do with uh, massive flooding that happened and massive movement of soil and deposits that came from poor farming um, that really transformed the whole riparian corridor to what we, we know of it as today. That when you're looking for Monacan artifacts, um, sometimes you have to go down four to six feet yeah. down below a layer of deposit that came down. And just that, to me, that story, um, is an important way of knowing um and then it gauges some people's interest well i'll tell you you don't want to <laughs> jeff jefferson did a lot to uh, cause a lot of erosion yeah no nope. i'll tell you that <laughs> holy cow so uh i mean they tried to remedy it with you know contour plowing that sort of thing but it was it was already the damage was done you know for a long time but yeah. uh you know i you know i get <laughs> believe it or not i've been uh, I've become a member of, or I'm an honorary member of the Garden Club Virginia now, and and I'm getting asked more and more to give lectures to Garden Club, you know, and these are ladies or whatever with, you know, that that have that are well landed <laughs> people who often um, live in very nice places with lots of land, and I don't know, I just want when I give, I'd like to get maybe. I mean, I'm sure I can look it up myself, but just to have a few slides during my talk where I can actually promote land conservation, you know, in a in a subtle way, you know, about mowing and things like that, that I just feel like I can make a difference just when I give all these, when I give talks around. That's my dog, that's why I have to mute all the time. She, she's nonstop barking tonight. Anyway. Peggy, I think, <laughs> go ahead. That would be so great. And Peggy, we have a slideshow already with some slides 
Um, the, even uh, letting people know about the bath, I think is a great thing. You know, some slides that talk about that here in Almar County, we do have a planning document that is uh, focused on preserving biodiversity and what is biodiversity? Why is it important? Could be, maybe that's an opening, but yeah, I'd be- I just like five. I mean, I remember you did that presentation for the Bird Club and maybe if I just get five slides that I can interject and just make a, get on a soapbox about it because I, I talk about it, you know, to groups and everything, but I think it'd be more effective if, if I, if I really brought people's attention to resources like, you know, that, they, that their husbands or whatever I can look into. So, and, and I think your entry to this is the birds. <laughs> yeah, the birds, exactly. Yeah. yeah start, with with the, start with the birds. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's me. <laughs> and Abigail? Yeah, I love this idea of sharing the bath with more people around the community. Um, is there perhaps like a Cliff Notes version of it? Because um, the document is very dense and unless someone's really interested in the deep policy, it's kind of hard to ingest. And if we had a version that was maybe one page or two, um, that might make it a little bit more accessible. And uh, I know when I first looked at it, I was like, oh, this is gonna take me a while. And so it might not be the best way to win people over, but we have something that maybe has some nice colors and is really clear. It might be a great way to get people excited about what we're doing. And then they can go look at the more detailed one if they want. I, I, I created a slideshow for a presentation for the Piedmont Master Gardeners where I talked about the BAP and the Natural Heritage Committee and just a, I really focused on native plants. And so I'd be happy to share that with you and you know, it's got some vis nice visuals and I pulled a lot of the slides from Kim's presentation that she uh, had given. I think it was for the, to the bird club, um, the Monticello bird club. So let me share that with you, if that would be helpful. Yeah, sure. Lonnie. Yeah, I was gonna say that they, um, there actually are, to dance what Dan mentioned, there are, photographs that we have at the conservation district. Actually, you can thank Stephen Meeks for this. Um, we have photographs of those big erosion gullies all over the county of what the county looked at like after this, after that happened. Um, and before people really adopted a lot of these conservation practices that we have now. So that was one of the things I just wanted to mention. Um, Lonnie, can you share that with all of us? Um, well, not easily. Um, I, I will, I will reach out to, um, to the district manager, um, and Coates and see if, um, they still have that in, in an easy place or even maybe Stephen Meeks too. But, um, yeah, that those materials do exist. Now let's see. Um, I do think, I do wonder whether the, um, just looking at these individual items, um, I kind of feel like we investigated item number one and maybe we need to remove it. Are there any thoughts on that? I have some thoughts just because I think that uh, there's, according to Kim, she still thinks that there may be some opportunities to, uh, to using the land use valuation program to encourage some of these conservation practices. So unless that ends up being a dead end, but I think that uh, consider reducing the minimum acreage that needs to go. Yeah, I think we would just scratch re reducing the minimum acre acreage. Yeah. yeah. But I do think we could use it to encourage some conservation practices that we're not encouraging now. Yeah, I think. Um, With, yeah. I mean, particularly, it allows people to qualify for land use valuation. Well, yeah, I think there are some opportunities there that can be looked at. Um, the The newer language that the state has approved has a lot more flexibility than the old language. Do you have? Can you send that out? Um, I have before. Um, I can. Okay. All right. Remind awesome. me. And when was the language change? 
Uh, I say new, but it was like a couple of years ago or something. Um, I don't know. I, I lose track of time with COVID and everything. But yeah. one of the things they they said explicitly was any any property under um, under a conservation agreement with an agency of the the state or the federal government. And so, if you're in any state or federal program, um, for example, you have a conservation plan written for your property. Um, that you're following, that would technically qualify you, according to the language of the state. Um, we haven't really done a good job of encouraging people or really adopting that as a county policy ourselves, but. All right. Yeah, so I, I think uh, that that first statement needs to be amended, but I think there is room for in you know, continuing to use those programs to encourage conservation. Number two, does everybody still feel that this is of value even though it has dropped off the radar for, for us and maybe we can renew that, especially um, when we're not all holding, you know, in, in our homes? It, it is, it's still, a, it's still a priority. Okay. I, I, think, um, I think it's important as well. I don't know that it quite falls under three because it's not really about education per se. Can you go back to number two? What was number two again? It's... Um, per, per, okay. I mean, there's another thing I'd like to see in here. It's sort of around, uh, just as I said, we need areas that explicitly have a comp plan designation for green space. Um, I think we may need explicit um, comp plan designation and or zoning and preferably the latter for agriculture. We don't have um, many cultures, many counties have what's um, have an explicit agricultural designation in their zoning. We don't. Our default zoning for the rural area is a residential zoning. So I think that would be another thing that as we look particularly through this, these comp plan changes um, that we might wanna look at, you know, all these areas that are in land use now, I mean, maybe we should actually rezone them to agriculture. I don't know enough about this to comment. Um, I think it's a good point, Lonnie. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's like a one. You know, like so, like with residential, you have different gradations of like of residential development, like R one, R two, R three, depending on how dense the residential development is, right? Oh. Um, and then um, and then a lot of counties also have like a one or a two, right? And that are there are explicitly meant to designate areas of, the, of their county that are supposed to be agriculture. That is the designation for that area. It's weird that we have like, as a county, we say we're protecting the rural area for agriculture, but we haven't really designated part of the county that's the best place for agriculture to go. Like, for example, designating areas of prime agricultural soils or areas actively in agriculture as A1. You know? Well, and what we're going to end up with is, is similar to what Culpeper and other parts of the state are experiencing with these uh, large uh, mega data sites that are taking up agricultural space. So we're losing areas uh, of agricultural production to, uh, you know, newer. Uh, higher value, I suppose, uh, tech technical or technology based service that's that's because these areas haven't been defined or aren't being used why owners are just going ahead and selling them for for new large projects I mean, now that may be the case with the solar project i'm not sure uh, christine maybe you can share more about that you know when we we get to that well uh, i think i think something like solar is a good example I mean, I think it is effectively what I would call a light industrial of a sort. I mean, it's it's really a 
industrial type. Oh, well, it's a utility, right? It's well, utility. It, it is, oh. but it's it involves a huge amount of construction, a huge amount of impervious surface, management of stormwater. Um, it, it's not like just putting up a cell tower, you know, or right. <laughs> it's... Um, it's it's a really big it's a big operation with a lot of you know environmental consequences, and and I support solar, but I would like it to be done right and and I think it's important to even for something like solar to say well here's the areas of the county we think it would be appropriate with solar, and maybe I mean we do that in the growth area we say here's here's where a spot in the the county where we think a you know heavy industry or some sort of industrial use is appropriate. And here's a place where we think, you know, apartments or residential buildings should be appropriate. For some reason, we don't do that in the rural area. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of out of sight, out of mind for a lot of folks that, that don't use the rural area um, or don't acknowledge the rural area for the importance it plays. I mean, uh, it, I just want to say that um, wineries have a huge impact. I was going to say wineries, yeah. Yeah, when they go in, um, just just the contouring of the land, the changes to the land, the roads that go in, everything that goes into it. it's an That's agriculture. Besides, it's like a desert. I think there's too many wineries around here. Well, and they also I like wine, but you know, <laughs> uh, wineries in in this area wouldn't exist without fungicides. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, they use a lot of chemicals on, you know. Yeah. Uh, my parents chainsawed theirs down after they realized how much they had to spray them. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, some agriculture has got a lot of impact. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, the comp plan is coming up for review. So these are good thoughts and good things to be thinking about. Uh, when that happens. But let's go ahead and see if we can uh, take a look at the, these last two recommendations for goal number three, uh, conduct landowner workshops and other events aimed at educating target audiences and the general public in promoting conservation. And uh, so just on that, you know, we do have our education working group and we, you know, we have Emma and I have and uh, Abigail have been to now. We went to two events this spring. We went to the Pollinator Festival in Scottsville and also Earth Day, and we brought the BAP with us and a lot of those materials, uh, and and talk to people about the Biodiversity Action Plan and uh, some of the things that people can do. And I just want to say that um, that the Piedmont Master Gardeners have really adopted a lot of these conservation ideas and are doing a lot to promote them. They just started a program called the Healthy Landscape, where um, you can a landowner can pay twenty five dollars. They'll get a packet of information, and then they'll have two trained master gardeners come to their property and give some advice and provide uh, a list of resources. And really on improving, looking at things like uh, storm water, protect, uh, stream protection, wildlife habitat, pesticide use, et cetera, et cetera. And I had the pleasure of doing my first visit on a property that was almost 200 acres over in Earliesville. And um, it was really rewarding. It was a great opportunity. People wanted to hear what I had to say. and. I was able to hopefully be helpful to them. And the other thing I've been working, uh, the Piedmont Master Gardeners have two mobile help desks. Uh, they have one at the Crozet Farmer's Market and then one at the Ix uh, Farmer's Market. And I'm doing the one at the Ix Market and I've had some really great conversations with people about many of the things that we're talking about. Uh, what can I, what kind of native plants can I grow? How can I make my uh, yard more uh, habit, better habitat for wildlife? So I think, uh, thank goodness for the Piedmont Master Gardeners. They're really helping to um, 
to fulfill this role, this educational role. And uh, like I said, I did. I made a I made a presentation to the Whitehall Rotans. Uh, Kim and I made one to the Bird Club. So I think there are other opportunities. So Peggy, that'd be awesome if you could uh, spread this word about the bat to the Garden Club. So if, if people can continue to think about other opportunities where we can use the slideshows that we've already developed and that we can spread this information. Bruce, you had your hand up. You have your hand up. Yes, um, I'd like to on number three, just delete the word landowner. Because I think it, uh, what you did, um, what you just described, the three events that you did, you didn't say, ask people in advance, are you a landowner? You mm -hmm. did the workshop. And I think it reads just as smoothly um, and it includes landowners, uh, but it also includes the general public. And I think that's part of what's missing mm -hmm. in the BAP is this uh, always looking for landowners. And they, it, there's a tendency to ignore the general public, which would include people, you know, who live in condos, people who are hoping to become landowners, but are renters, mm -hmm. um, you know, all those people. And we want that, you know, it also would include children, frankly. Um, yeah. People who live so in the I think, <laughs> yeah, I think just getting rid of the word landowner doesn't prevent us from doing landowner workshops but it also allows it to be a little less uh, constrained. Agreed. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Yes. Uh, Christine, uh, yes. there's also an opportunity to partner with PMG on some of the programs that we're doing, uh, you know, in, in, that, are, that are part of what the Speakers Bureau is, is working with uh, the center. In this case, we have three more opportunities the rest of this year. Uh, the next one's coming up on August 2nd. Deborah Harriman's gonna uh, present on uh, water-wise gardening. Um, and, you know, when we talked about Michelle uh, Merdeza and uh, Steve Spitzer uh, last month made presentations on the pollinator garden at the center, we had, we had about 54 people present. So we're, we're getting a large audience to come in uh, who are interested in, in using the center um, is one way to um, target audiences uh, of landowners, uh, of folks that live in condos, of folks that uh, live in small properties, uh, as well as townhouses, things like that. So maybe there's an opportunity there to do some partnering. Absolutely. I think, uh, I think everybody will agree that that goal, that recommendation needs to stay. And the fourth one, uh, serve as an information source and clearinghouse for landowners, which could also be, <laughs> uh, you know, landowners and the general public and promote conservation efforts on the part of landowners and the general public. And uh, the only, I think- The only thing I question about that is that, yeah. is it makes it seem like that we are the, the central knowledge base about these conservation issues when there are other there are other expert partner agencies. Um, and so I don't know exactly how I would tweak that language, but definitely include something about, you know, partner organizations and their and not make the implication that we are the we are a primary source of information about conservation, but more that we are a conduit maybe for helping the public find some of these resources. Yeah, I think uh, just making a clarification with that. And, you know, we have made some progress. This was really on the part of the county staff is with the environmental stewardship hub, which I think is just, uh, just great that we have it. Uh, it and, and we do have that. We, did work on getting the that natural the resources landowner resources PDF, but where it links out to a lot of these partner organizations. But I 
this Kim will be listening to this recording and hopefully she will be taking note of that comment, Lonnie. Is, is, are we missing anything for goal three? Is there anything that we need to add? I think it's been a, a fruitful discussion. All right, thanks you guys. Thank you very much for that. So we are going to go back to our agenda. Um, the we the education and outreach group did not meet, uh, but I I did. I think I've told you a little bit. I told you about the pollinator festival, uh, and I <laughs> healthy landscapes. Some of the work with the Piedmont Master Gardeners, and then I, I do want to just report on. Uh, the, not, I would say pretty much completion of the Almaro County Historical Society. I worked with the village school, a teacher at the village school, and the kids did a really great job. There's an, a nice kiosk and they uh, made some great infographics of some of the native plants. They talked about some of the medicine, connecting it to uh, the indigenous populations and had a little bit about the medicine, <laughs> medicinal value and uh, the ecological value of some of these native plants that we put in there. So if you get a chance to go by, it's always fun when I'm there working on it, somebody will walk by and say, I love it. Thank you so much. I've been looking at the infographics. I'm, someone said, I'm gonna be collecting some seeds. I'm starting my own little native uh, plot. So it's a, it's in a real, get a lot of foot traffic there. So where, where is it again? It's across from Lee Park. It's on, between, by behind the library is the Almaro County Historical Society, the central library downtown. So it's just a little pocket garden with a nice big kiosk. Um, and I think that's all I have to report. Is it under, under the ash tree in there? There is an ash tree in the courtyard. Big, big ash tree that yes. they actually, you know, treating it so that it's gonna it's it's a it's a tree steward um significant tree so it's being treated for emerald ash borer but yeah I, i've never been into that little pocket garden but yeah i, I go by it all the time so i'll check <laughs> yeah the, the one that we did with the the village school is just a little strip under the kiosk and then the master gardeners went in and did a bunch of planting in the courtyard garden okay and, and i'll planted a bunch of natives in there Oh, good. Yeah. So it's, you know, there's a nice native planting over there by Clark School. Um, you know, they have a little vegetable garden there, but they have yeah. a strip, uh, that's still doing pretty well. I, I have a feeling Lonnie or, or maybe Devin had something to do with it. Um, but uh, it's, it has a little path that ran. It's just a small spot, but it has a lot of nice natives in it. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, what it's school? a Clark Not school. Oh, yeah. Devin, that's a Devin project. Yeah. I thought it was. Yeah. Yeah. And they've got a pawpaw tree there too, which is super cool. Oh my, yeah. A, a good sized pawpaw. Yeah. You know, I did a summer program, uh, summer school with the master gardeners and kids spent a bunch of time. There's tons of bees in there. Mm -hmm. There are, yeah. Yeah. It's so, the mountain men in there. That yeah, exactly. Um, all right. The other thing I had, uh, I'm kind of hesitant to bring this up, but let's see, we have time. Let's go ahead. Uh, I didn't hear anything from Leah about wildlife corridors, or I don't know, Bruce, you have had, you had some ideas about trying to get biodiversity in curriculum and in the schools being taught in the schools. I wonder if you made any progress with that or. I haven't made any progress, but I, I've populated my ideas on paper that so. That's where that is right now. So, so yeah, I think that that's something that I've thought about for a long time is, you know, and I've come across teachers who are very interested in the idea as well of uh, integrating some of the material of the biodiversity action plan into their curriculum. You know, because almost all the schools have something about, for example, endangered species or climate change. But yeah, I don't know of a single school in Amaral that talks about Amaral County's rare species or 
the specific impacts of climate change to our ecosystems. So I think I think that could be very helpful in, in terms of, you know, like I've long said, you know, our our, our Cornus canadensis in Albemarle County and our paper birch forest is kind of a flagship for climate change. Here you have an ecosystem that's literally on the brink of destruction um, due to warming temperatures. And I think, you know, bring attention to that about these interesting places and species or, or the Canadian plum for that matter. I mean, I think, um, I think that can bring things home and make things a little bit more real than, you know, I mean, polar bears are great. We don't have polar bears in Albemarle County. One of the things that I did when I was teaching is I had, I, I, my seventh graders do animal riddles, but they did it of animals that live here in Virginia that are native to Virginia. And they think they know a lot about them, but they realize that, you know, they don't. And they found some really just fun facts about the creatures that are in their own backyards. And there, I believe that Amaral County will be uh, starting up again the meaningful watershed experience. Uh, was it MeWe? Yeah, and, MeWe, and the, the conservation district um, helps with that. Yeah, and I think they're looking for volunteers as a master naturalist. I just signed up to do that. So maybe there's some opportunities to get more biodiversity conversations in with those kids when they're out there having that experience. Policy committee, did you guys have an opportunity to meet? We, we did not have an opportunity to meet. Um, I did say, see, did I give you the guys the update on the discussions about gravel roads that occurred? There's a, I, th I thought I mentioned at the last meeting about- You did. Have, okay. Yeah. That was that was one of the big big things I think that that happened. Well, um, stream health. I, I I'm curious to know what's coming forward with stream health. I know. Oh, I do have an update on something. Um, so um, Frank Frank Paul, um, who talked to us about stormwater, and. Um, he talked to Crozet has this big issue going on where there's a stream that was buried. You know, he talked to us about it too. Mm -hmm. um, so the Crozet, um, the Crozet Community Advisory Committee. I'm gonna get. I, I need to know. I need to say it right. The CAC um, for Crozet. They they actually had Frank come and and talk to them as well. And they had a lot of very interesting questions about like how is this allowed to happen? You know. I thought we had a required buffer of 100 feet. How does someone just like remove a stream? And like, so it's very interesting to see an entire community like Crozet, like suddenly like really interested in these things that we've been talking about in the policy group for a long time about these gaps in the water protection ordinance. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Lonnie, what I recommend is maybe reaching out to Kim when she gets back from her holiday. And, you know, when you hear more directly from her, the, if that's something that you want to get together with the policy committee and, and see which way, in what ways you can support that work. Yeah, and, oh, and, and I, I guess I should mention, I guess everyone knows that I'm now a planning commissioner. <laughs> so. Congratulations, we're very happy about that. Thanks. So um, as items come up before the planning commission that I feel like that you all may need to know about, or if there's, there are concerns that you'd like me to know about, I hope you'll take those opportunities to convey this to me. Thank you, Lonnie. Um, yeah, it's great that you're, you have that position. I think you can really do a lot of good things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I did. Well, I probably shouldn't say too much about it, but there's, <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a meeting there. The next meeting that's coming up um, has, has some interesting, interesting topics. Um, there's a, there's a proposal to um, remove the, remove the sidewalks on one side of a neighborhood, but also to remove the planting strips. Mm -hmm. So 
if you haven't, you know, um, as that, get, if that gets published, um, feel free to look at that and, and provide your own input. I, I will be providing my own input. All right, thanks, Lonnie. I'm, I think if you don't mind, I'll, I'll give you guys a little update on the Woodridge Solar Project. And so it's a very large piece of property owned by the Purcells uh, in Southern Albemarle, and they're gonna be leasing it uh, to Hex, it's the people that are developing is Hexagon Energy, and it'll there'll be 640 acres. The the solar farm will include 640 acres of land, and um, there will be quite a bit of land disturbance because they any slope that is more than 15 degrees, they're going to have to level that out. So everything has to be less than a 15 degree slope. And so there's going to be a lot of land moving, earth moving, dirt moving. And um, some of you guys had brought up this idea of are there prime agricultural soils there? Yes, there are on this property that's going to be affected. And the developer has been very open to the possibility of using the Pollinator Smart program uh, and has looked into that. But just recently, he has uh, spoken to somebody here in Almaro County who's interested in grazing sheep on potentially all of it. And so that we will see how that ends up going. Well, those, th those two things don't have to be in conflict with each other. Well, apparently there is a seed mix. It's called uh, Buzz and Buzz. I don't know if any of you are familiar. If you're interested, like maybe I can share that seed mix with you. It doesn't. It has a couple natives, but I'd be interested in getting uh, other people's feedback on that. And uh, so the land would have to. It's right now. It's the land is industrially forest log. Uh, timbered. And so part of the property has recently been logged. Some of it, um, there will, trees will have to be cut. And so there was a, the first virtual public meeting was held last week, I believe it was, and there'll be additional ones. And I can keep you guys up to date on that. So, th so the thing that I would say is, um, you'd want to make sure that all the all the streams, including perennial and intermittent, um, you go. I would go back and check the um, county GIS and make sure that all the streams that they have on there, the perennial and intermittent, all have a hundred foot buffer. It what will they, be. Yes. They 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 that will be included. So they've been uh, pretty good about uh, the size of the buffer, and, and so I think there there are some good opportunities. Uh, Kim has reviewed the plan. Scott Clark, who's the head planner, is in the process of reviewing. And I'm really hoping that uh, they will be participating, at least on part of the property, in the Pollinator Spark program, uh, because it actually, uh, DCR has really done a nice job laying out a management plan, and it calls for the management of invasive species over time. So these are 35 year projects, right? And so it's just not a one and done deal. No, where, where, where do you get the buzz and fuzz? The buzz and fuzz. It where, is, you I'm know. i to see what it is and where it comes from. I will, I'll send you the list. I, that's from Ernst. Okay. Oh, Ernst is pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and they can do custom seed mixes yeah. too. They don't have to. So, I mean, like if you, and they can even do like, they can do regional seed mixes. So they even keep some, um, like even though they're not in Virginia, they do keep a certain number of Virginia ecotypes. So, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the possibility of a custom seed mix is something that they can do. 
Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, I don't have the expertise to say, well, sheep can do well on these particular species of plants. So, um, so that would be interesting, but hopefully, and I had a, a great talk with the director of the Pollinator Smart program. And one of the things that they're really hoping to do is get more of those Virginia ecotypes and really looking for, um, they're going to be sending people out gathering up, gathering seed. Uh, and one of the things they're looking for are stands of gray goldenrod. So that's, I'm hoping to reach out to Devin and see if he can help. Um, but they, they could use some help on the ground uh, if they are in gathering seed for some of these species. So it's, it's a pretty exciting program that they've got going. And there's definitely need for it because I started looking at, I looked at Dominion's website and there are a lot of solar farms going in all over Virginia. There's a couple of really big ones in Louisa County. Um, and oh, I also got an update. I know that Scott had talked about the Midway Solar Project, even though it was approved, uh, the developers are not have decided not to develop it at this time, which is interesting. Huh, that is an interesting thing. You know, yeah. one of the things that concerned me about that is that part of Midway looks like it was, um, it, it goes to Dickwoods Road, which is one of our unpaved roads in the county. And I was really concerned that if they put that solar farm there, that they would be tempted to use that Dickwood Road to access Midway, um, which would then put pressure as people saw these big trucks coming and going all the time would, would put pressure on them to pave it, which would, which would be bad. Yeah. yeah, and I think one thing that, one question I have is, uh, would it be of, important for Almoral County to actually have an ordinance uh, that regulates, provides guidelines for these solar projects um, rather than doing it sort of on a case by case basis? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I think there's several different answers to that. Um, I think one of the other options, and actually this came up at the last planning commission meeting, was the idea of performance-based standards. The idea of saying it would still be approved by staff, but here would be a set of performance criteria that you would need to meet in order to be approved. And I kind of like that idea. I think it's an interesting, interesting idea. You could include things like the pollinator smart um, stream buffers and those sorts of things in the criteria. Um, and there, there's pluses and minuses in both those, you know, both those approaches. I think the concern based upon past conversations in this committee and elsewhere that, that I've heard from staff is that if you, if you make it explicitly a, um, an ordinance, like this is what you need to have to be approved, then um, you don't have very much flexibility. Yeah, I, I think it, I think you, I agree. It makes sense to have these performance-based standards, but we need to get them in place. Oh, we need to get them in place yesterday. I mean, absolutely. Yesterday. Yeah. Um, because those missed opportunities for the Rivanna solar that, you know, you know, it sounds like they're, the Lots. developer was willing to use a pollinator mix, but it wasn't asked of them. It wasn't put in the, you know, as a condition for the special use permit. Yeah, and th that's that's part of the that's part of the issue. I would say is that it's, you know, there's, you, I think there's great value in having these things defined up front. And be completely transparent so that, you know, exactly. I mean, not just have performance based standards, but having them be public so that when someone says, hey, we'd like to build a solar farm in Albemarle County, they can say, oh, these are the things we need to do. I think a lot of these companies are more than willing to, I think a lot of them want to do the right thing. And they certainly want their project to be approved, right? Okay. So, um, you know, I think if you make all that transparent up front, so there's no, you know, surprises on either part, then it's a win-win for everyone. 
Absolutely. Now, if, now if they're not willing to, to buffer streams or, you know, do the right thing, you know, in terms of meeting, you know, basic criteria that we set forth, then maybe they should find somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. But I agree. I think the, the, con the developers do, you know, they want to meet the criteria. They just need to know what it is. And we need to be able to be explicit about that. So I just looked up the fuzz and buzz and it's uh, gray goldenrod is the least common. It's less than five, less than half a percent of the mixed composition. And Kentucky bluegrass is up there at almost 19% of the mix. So you said that we should have done this yesterday. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, if you are interested, I'll, I have lots of some information I can share with you. Um, but would love if you do have some Peggy, especially you, if you'd have some input on some of those seed mixes, I'd love to get that. I'm just thinking about Tufton Farm. What right now it's you know they're I I I've kept them from mowing the fields while the meadowlarks are nesting, but the fields are full of Canada thistle and uh, it's they really look rough right now. <laughs> so they, yeah. they, they really need to do something to get some warm seeds and grasses and. I guess the whole thing needs to be either burned or something and then start over again. It's, just, it's really a kind of a mess. Yeah. And, you know, what do you do if the sheep selectively graze and don't eat the invasive plants in there? You eat goats to eat the invasive plants. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you're, this is a, a 30 year in 35 year endeavor. So. Well, it's an, it's, it, you know, so much reach out to Tom Olivier, you know, he has sheep. Oh, that's a good a good suggestion. I can do that because I know him very well. He's a past member of this committee. He may have yeah. some interesting insights. Yeah, that is a really great suggestion. Thanks, Lonnie. Well, you guys, I promised to end this meeting early. <laughs> so hey, it's but it's still 7:15. Yeah. But I think we can do it unless anybody else has something else they want to add. No, I was going to offer, you know, I, you know, we should have, we had a member of the public here, we probably should have had a, um, um, any comments from the public section at the beginning, I was hoping that Neil would hold on long enough, I would have loved to hear if he had any comments, but. No, there, are, there are no, um, no attendees at present. Yes, I, I see, I see that. But uh, maybe next time we should have comments from the comments from the public at the at the front um, in our next agenda, just in case. I we second have that. Yeah. All right. Well, we will remember to do that. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for a great meeting, and uh, hope you guys enjoy the rest of your July. And we will look forward to seeing you in August. And then in September, we are having an in-person meeting at the county office building. So oh, good. remember, you're going to have to get in your we, cars and drive to town. If we can get a plan to, to have a group meeting, like Lonnie was saying, I mean, you were saying September, but, yeah. but maybe uh, during the summer too. I mean, during August. Yeah. Um, Lonnie, the Red, what, the Red Hill, uh, the Red Hills Red. wetlands. Yeah, it's it's doable. I mean, we have to give staff enough planning time to declare the open meeting, and you know, yeah, we have to make sure we get it to them a couple of weeks in advance. Okay. Yeah. But um, I think it's, it's possible. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, let's maybe offline or something talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we'll do a poll and see if people we get it some uh, some time okay. when people are going to be in town. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right, you guys, take care. Thanks for the great meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye.